man in the corner of my eye. He is one of my earliest memories. I call him the man in the corner of my eye. I don't know who he is or what he wants. The night I first saw him, I was about five or six years old. The memory starts with my dad. In those days, he was in bad shape. He drank every night and smoked weed continuously. This had resulted in, me in wearing situations where he'd simply lost his mind. This night was one of them, as he frantically pulled me out of my bed and put me in the car before my sleepy self had even noticed what was going on. I don't know exactly how long he drove for, but after a while, we arrived, and he pulls me into this decrepit looking house. The man inside greeted us, and after my dad handed him some money, he picked me up and dragged me inside. I remember screaming for my dad to save me, as he kept saying it was for my own good. The stranger, he put me in the centre of a room where all the windows had been covered with newspapers, and told me to stay put as he closed the door, turning the room pitch black. He started to chant softly, and I started to cry. Not having any idea what was going on, the room was pitch black, but I could swear I saw shapes moving all around me. For an hour, I was in the room. As I lay terrified in the centre of the room, I don't recall most things that happened clearly, but I remember in the end. My mother barging in, picking me up from the floor and running outside as the man yelled at her, saying he wasn't finished yet. My mother told me at an older age that my father was convinc conv convinced an evil spirit or demon had possessed me and I was in dire need of exorcism. Maybe my father wasn't crazy and my mother ruined the exorcism by interrupting. Perhaps the man is a result of the failed exorcism itself. I honestly have no idea. My mum brought me to my grandparents' house where I would be safe for the night. The, no the night I woke to a sudden realisation that someone was standing over the bed. A tall, lanky man. The room was too dark to see details, but I knew he was looking at me. He slowly moved his arms through the dark. It was too long and out of proportion with the rest of his body. My younger self was so afraid I couldn't scream or move as he made a gesture that I would need to be quiet. As the man slowly walked away from my bed and dissipated into the corner of my vision, I didn't sleep that night. Ever since that dreadful night, I've encountered him throughout many parts of my life. Never as clearly as any small, you know, nothing more than small glimpses. Sometimes it's just noises or doors that are suddenly open, when I know for sure I'm all alone in my house. Well, at first, <laughs> it was hard to notice. I'd be walking in my house, enter a room to notice him standing in the hallway in the last moment. When I looked into the hallway properly, he'd be gone. I'd inspect a door that wasn't open before and see a glimpse of him right as the door closed. I would look up the staircase to see his head disappear over the railing. I'd catch a glimpse of him moving around the corner as I turned around in the shower to grab some soap or shampoo. He seems to be coming closer with every appearance, however. The more depressed, afraid or alone I am, the stronger, more frequent and closer he seems to get. He doesn't seem to appear when others can see him, though making him the biggest reason I'm afraid to live by myself. I don't know what he wants, I don't know what he is, and I don't know where he came from. The events are seemingly at random, and it's currently been over a year and a half since I last sighted him. But I know he's gone. He's just hiding in the corner of my eye. Missed connection. A missed connection ad pulled from our local Craigslist. Male for female, St. Louis. I'm looking for the woman I met at our local Schnucks market. I first noticed you walking down the produce aisle. Beautiful, beautiful blonde hair, light blue cardigan pulled tight, a yellow floral dress cut up above the knee. Not asking for attention, but wouldn't shy away from it if presented. I could work with that. You purposely brushed my arm as you reached for a head of lettuce. I could immediately feel the connection between us, like a spark that had been there for 100,000 years. Then you responded, oh, pardon me. No need to be coy, dear. I know you just wanted to feel your skin against mine. I could hear the want in your voice. I should have just taken your hints and initiated conversation right then and there, but I decided to play it safe. I looked into your angelic blue eyes and murmured the only thing I could muster. 
no worries. And there will never be any worries when we're together. As you pulled away to continue your shopping, you flipped your hair and I caught a smell of lavender. I never knew how much that smell would entice me until this day. It became my favourite smell in the world. I paced you through the rest of your shopping trip, far enough not to be noticed, trying to decide if I should capitalise on your advances and introduce myself. But before I could build up the courage, you were in the checkout. I cut my shopping short so I could get in the lane next to you. I just needed to be close to you. Not blow my chance that you've set up for me. And try to get close enough to smell you again. The checkout guy was making small talk, being vaguely flirty. I couldn't believe the fucking nerve of this guy. Flirting with you, my love, my life right in front of me. It took everything I had not to tear his goddamn voice box out right there in aisle six. But I kept my cool and the encounter was quickly fleeting. We walked out of the market at the same time. You acting like you didn't notice me, playing hard to get. So cute. You parked your blue PT Cruiser three down, three cars down from mine. What a coincidence. Maybe you knew it was my car and wanted me to notice. <laughs> Maybe it's fate. I followed you the 7.8 miles to your neighbourhood. You live in a modest little bi-level house at the, end, at the dead end road. I had to talk to you. I couldn't let this opportunity pass. I built up the nerve to ring the doorbell, but much to my surprise, a young little girl of about 10 answered the door. I knew she had to be yours. She was a spitting image of you. She's going, going to grow into a beautiful woman someday, I'm certain. I ask if her mother's home and she turns up to go fetch you. I sprint down the street as not to be seen. I chickened out again. The idea of you having a daughter has brought up so many questions, love. Are you married? Do you love someone else aside from me? That's supposed to be our daughter. Our house. He could you, how could you let some other fucking man be most intimate with you behind my fucking back? The thoughts dissipate as I can see you come to the front porch and look around. You act like you don't see me, but I know you do. The way you hike up your skirts just an inch as you climb the stairs lets me know you know what I want. I couldn't get the nerve to go back to the door, so I return the next morning. As I sit in my car with the sun raising behind me, I see the porch slap flip on. And out you come to start your car, wearing nothing but a bath towel. Is this for me? Did you know I was going to be there? An apology for relationships that should have been mine? It was just a few seconds before seeing what you decided to show me. I couldn't help but relieve myself to you, right there in my car. I'm sure this is what you wanted. I'm catching on to your little game, so I'm going to add a stipulation of my own. As I'm not sure you read Craigslist, I'll throw out another way of getting you in contact with me. I know the sexual chemistry is there. I know the want is there. If you want me as much as I want you, wear that blue cardigan and I'll take it as a sign. There's my green light. Then I'll rush back into your house and do all the things that you've been begging me to do through all your little nuisances. Blue cardigan. I'll be watching. Kiss, kiss, kiss. The man in the photograph. On the afternoon of July 7th, 1865, Guards escort four condemned prisoners to the gallows of Fort McNair, Washington, D.C. Each prisoner's ankles and wrists were bound by manacles. More than a thousand people, including government officials, members of the U.S. armed forces, friends and family of the accused, official witnesses and reporters watched. There, in front of the thousand-strong crowd, the assassins of President Abraham Lincoln were hanged by the neck until they were dead. There's a famous photograph of the event which depicts a number of soldiers on a walkway that stands over the gallows. However, one of the men in the walkway is not wearing a military uniform. He wears a wide brimmed hat and civilian clothing. He is smiling. This is the man in the photographs. The man reappears in a photo showing the aftermath of the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. There he stands, the same wide brimmed hat and smiling, features present at the 
event which was snowballing and called to me into the depths of 20 million people. He features in old photographs depicting the panic and horror in the faces of the stock traders on Black Friday, 1929. His smile looking disturbingly out of place in the, most, in the midst of ruined men and broken lives. In photos of Nazi rallies and concentration camp victims, he is there. The same clothes, the same twisted smile contorting his lips. He is there during the aftermath of the Jonestown massacre, standing among the hundreds of corpses, men, women and children. He smiles in the background of the photos taken in the wake of the Columbine shooting. His blank eyes and crooked smile in stark contrast to weeping mothers and heartbroken school friends. In amateur footage taken of the morning of September 11th, 2001, he is in present on multiple occasions, watching from the New Jersey Turnpike, smiling as he watches the destruction unfold. The towers collapse, people run screaming from the dust cloud, but the man in the photograph just walks, smiling as he is swallowed up by all of the consuming debris. This morning, I awoke particularly early, in time to catch the orange and pink sunrise as it dawned over the Boston suburbs. I turned on the TV, making sure the volume was acceptably low, gazing out the window at the freezing winter morning. It was beautiful, so beautiful that I took out my iPhone and began to take a photograph. The Venezuelan president has warned the US to stay out of his nation's affairs as US Navy warships begin to sail towards the South American coastline. I adjusted the camera settings, ensuring the shades of gold and fuchsia would be captured perfectly by the lens. It's not every morning that such a glorious sunrise rises over Roxbury. Moments like that are worth capturing. Whilst the Chinese Premier has promised that any US intervention will be met with swift, decisive military action from the People's Liberation Army. I checked the photo, amazed at how well it had come out. The warm morning light seemed to creep into every little corner of the vista, except one. There was a large bay window a few streets over. It contained the figure of a man. China stated that they were not ruling out they're not ruling the use of tactical nuclear weapons. He wore a wide brimmed hat. This is surely a tense time for our nation's armed forces. His smile stretched wide across his face. 